This video lecture is entitled Character or Virtue Ethics. This video lecture is for the course Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision Making at the East Asia School of Theology. Now, in the previous lecture, we looked at um, two different ethical systems, consequentialist ethics and principle ethics. We looked at, we looked at what these um, ethical approaches are, and then we evaluated them. We, we looked at their positives and negatives. So in this um, lecture, video lecture, we are going to look at character ethics, which is often also called virtue ethics. So we're going to consider what character or virtue ethics is, and then we're going to evaluate this approach to ethics. So let's consider how virtue ethics differs from consequentialist and principle ethics. The first way that it differs is in consequentialist ethics, the concern is to determine what outcomes stem from the moral choices we make. So in consequentialist ethics, the focus is on results. Now in principle ethics, the concern is for knowing and doing what is right, as well as avoiding and abstaining from what is wrong. So in principle ethics, the focus is on specific laws and principles. Now, character ethics is quite different because in character or virtue ethics, the focus and concern are on the general character of the person as it has been developed over time. The idea is that virtuous people exhibit certain characteristics that cannot be obtained easily or quickly. Virtues take time and effort to form, and when once they do form, they become second nature. As Dennis Hollinger um, puts it in your textbook, character or virtue ethic argues that the traditional approaches of consequentialism and principle ethics are not only wrong-headed in their foundations and methodologies, but they also ask the wrong questions about ethics and the moral life. The key issue is not what ought we to do, but rather what ought we to be. The kind of people we are as evidenced by our virtues firmly implanted within is the heart and essence of ethics. So this is what virtue ethics is about. So in the past 50 to 60 years, especially this view, character ethics has enjoyed a significant resurgence of interest in the arena of philosophical ethics. Some, some important proponents of this view include Aristotle, St Stanley Harwas, Alistair McIntyre, and Carol Gilligan. Uh, there are many other advocates of virtue ethics as well. So here are some possible supporting biblical passages to support virtue ethics. One of these is 1 Samuel 16, 7, where, uh, which says, the Lord does not look at the thing man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then in Mark 7, 21 to 23, Jesus tells his disciples, for from within, out of men's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, 
greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So these are some biblical passages that can be used to support virtue ethics. And they talk about how what's important is not just our outward actions, but more importantly, the character that leads to these outward actions. So let's look at some key aspects of virtue ethics. One of the key aspects of virtue ethics is that moral living involves more than an isolated concern about individual ethical choices. That is to say, moral choices are made on the basis of a person's character and are not atomistic, arbitrary, or made in some sort of volitional vacuum. They have a context and a history, which leads us to the next point. Character is shaped over long periods of time within the context of communities and the important stories that people live out and tell one another. But this requires a discussion of the many knotty questions surrounding the nature of being, also known as ontology. In other words, it concerns itself with the nature of the person performing an act and not simply the act itself. Another key aspect of virtue ethics is that ethical decisions are evaluated not only on the specific actions performed, as well as for what end or goal that, that are carried out, but also for the motivation which lie behind such actions. For example, when Peter brings grandma a cake because he loves her, and wants to on, show honor to her, we commend his character and his pure motives and right attitude. But when Judy brings grandma a cake because she wants to get in good with grandma and get a piece of her estate when she dies, we condemn her for ulterior motives and selfishness. So we see that Ethical decisions are based not only on what actions are performed, but also for on the basis of the motivation behind those actions. Another key aspect of virtue ethics is that virtues, unlike passions, are enduring aspects of our being which consistently characterize a person's general nature and are formed by the habitual choices that we make, as well as the affections we cultivate over long periods of time. So much of a person's evaluation stems from the nature of the one performing the act. Thus, Deontological ethics are useful for the Christian, for example, but the right activities that are informed by duty-centered ethics should be performed by an honest and ethical person in order for them to be truly good actions. Therefore, there is much more to morality than right actions, motives, attitudes, affection, and things such as these play a central role in the process of determining the morality of an action. And these things constitute the virtuous content of a person's character. Okay, 
So these are some key aspects of virtue ethics that we've looked at. Now, let's look at some traditional virtues. First, we're going to look at the four cardinal virtues, the first of which is prudence or wisdom. Here, the idea is that a person knows how to act in the right way at the right time with the right motives. The person knows, for example, when to forge ahead, which is the virtue of courage, and when to fall back, which is the virtue of prudence. They also know how courage is different from being reckless and foolhardy and how prudence is different from cowardice. So um, here is a quote from the play Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare that illustrates um, this virtue. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which when taken at the flood leads on to fortune, omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea, we are now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. So the idea here is that there is a right time to do certain actions. And part of wisdom is knowing when is the right time to do such actions. A second cardinal principle is temperance. This encompasses the idea of restraint and self-denial versus self-indulgence and a lack of self-control. So this is something that our parents, your parents probably tried to teach you. And so this is a virtue that needs to be cultivated over an entire lifetime. And it is the second of the four cardinal virtues. The third cardinal virtue is justice. Justice is the ability to apply righteousness to life situations and events so as to bring about equity or equality and goodness. For example, treating employees in a fair manner is an example of justice because you want to, um, you don't want to favor one employee over another. And at the same time, you want to give employees what is due to them. So this is the virtue of justice. And the fourth cardinal virtue is the virtue of courage. This is not the absence of fear, but the refusal to let fear have the final say and to trust that moving forward in a situation is the best course of action to bring about the best results and outcome. So this slide, in this slide, we have a picture of Leonard Seppala, who was who together with Togo, who is the dog on the left, and other dog sleds, dogs. Um, and so in this photo, we have Leonard Seppala, Togo, and the other dog sled dogs that helped to deliver life-saving medicine to Nome, Alaska in 1925. Now, the reason why I included this picture in this slide is because Leonard Seppala and his dogs faced many physical dangers on their way during their um, trek to Nome, Alaska in 1925. And so they had to face these dangers, but they did it because Leonard knew that unless he delivered this medicine, many people in Nome would have died from disease. And so this is an example of courage. So we've looked at the four 
Um, the four cardinal virtues. Now let's look at the three theological virtues. These come from Paul and are explicitly quoted in 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. But Paul shares these in other passages of, of passages of Scripture as well, such as 1 Thessalonians 1.3 and 1 Thessalonians 5.8. And so these three theological virtues are faith, hope, and love. So, look, so let's look at these three theological virtues. So the first theological virtue is faith. And this is the idea of full trust and reliance. So if you are a person who is um, faithful, then others can trust you fully and they can fully rely upon you. So just as we are to have full reliance and trust upon the Lord, so are we to live our lives in such a way that we are people who can also be relied and trusted upon. The second theological virtue is the virtue of hope. Hope includes the ability to envision the future in the present because of the promises and faithfulness of God in the past, giving us the ability to transcend and endure our current circumstances with perseverance and trust. So hope, trust in what will happen at the end of the story, even if the present is very messy. The third theological virtue is love. Love is also called charity. Since God is in his very nature, essence, love, it would make sense that this is a primary virtue in Christian ethics. If we aspire to be imitators of God, imagining his nature, imaging his nature and purposes in the world, then love must characterize our lives through and through. Note too that this kind of love is not simply sentimental or emotional in nature. Sentimental and emotional love can be important, but the love we're talking about here is not just sentimental or emotional love because the love we're talking about seeks the best of the beloved, even when that means hardship, struggle, and pain along the way, knowing that these are means to growth and maturity in Christ. This is why 1 Corinthians 13 speaks of how love is not self-seeking, how love always protects, etc. So those are the um, cardinal virtues and the theological virtues. Now, let's look at some other commonly proposed goals of human virtue. So the few I share below are hardly an exhaustive list. For example, I would not mention such things as Epicurean tempered pleasure seeking, which might be deemed peace of mind, or what could be called stoic resigned self-control, or even Plotinus's unity with the divine. In addition, when we get to Confucianism, we will see yet another vision for the perfect and virtuous man, the scholar, saint, and gentleman, which, by the way, is a distinctly masculine goal. There are others as well, of course. The point is not to seek a comprehensive listing of possible goals for becoming a virtuous person. The point being illustrated here is that the concept of virtue is not without a history, 
nor without a need to provide specific content as to what constitutes a virtuous person and vir a virtuous lifestyle, both through time as well as in the contemporary context. So one commonly proposed goal of virtue is goodness. And this is according to Plato. So this, this goal comes from Plato. And it is important to note here that the Platonic concept of goodness is not like the typical way we define or understand goodness. According to Plato, goodness is correspondence to and participation in the ultimate form of goodness that Plato envisions in his book, The Republic. As such, it includes pure reason and clarity of understanding that the world, according to Plato, is but a shadow of the real. So that's in this system, detachment from earthly pleasures and a deep contemplation of the good, that's good with a capital G, is the goal of the virtuous life. So this is what goodness is according to Plato. And this, is, this has been one proposed goal for the virtuous life. Another proposed goal for the virtuous life is happiness or well-being. And this goal originally comes from Aristotle and brings with it the idea that we are designed for certain ends. There is a goal, a teleos, toward which we must strive, and by doing so, we draw nearer and nearer to the virtuous goal of human well-being and flourishing. The teleos includes excellence in rationality, that is knowing what is good and right, but also excellence in the directing of the will or choosing what is right. But the goal is more than merely moral. It includes a practical and functional element as, as well that is not strictly related to no moral issues. In contemporary life, Americans, for example, have seized on this ideal. For example, from we in the US Constitution, uh, actually the Declaration of Independence, we find the word life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Americans in turn interpret um, this term happiness in a very individualistic and unrestricted manner, but without any clear sense of an internal design or directedness towards something specific other than finding ways to feel pleasure and avoid pain. So, it is not at all clear how happiness is achieved in this case or where people are supposed to direct their energies to avoid certain actions and pursue others which will result in happiness. And because of secularism, many people tragically and often unconsciously believe that material pursuit and acquisition are the means to find happiness. And sad to say, Christians are far from immune from this kind of thinking. Another proposed goal for virtue is that of holiness or Christ-likeness. This is, of course, a distinctly Christian and biblical approach, um, a distinctly biblical and Christian goal. But since this is a Christian ethics course, it is appropriate to mention it here. So let's evaluate virtue ethics. As virtue ethics rightly emphasizes, ethical choice decisions 
involve more than isolated actions and must also assess the overall motives and intention as well as the character of the person making the ethical choices. So in other words, doing the right thing for the wrong reason is still an immoral act. So virtue ethics rightly concerns itself with, with coupling or connecting ethical oughts with the moral agent. So that is definitely something positive about virtue ethics. Biblically speaking, God is far more concerned with the heart, the inner being of a person, than he is with simply their external actions. The legalist, on the other hand, is concerned with the about the ethical actions we perform. But God is concerned with the overall orientation of our whole lives. So this is another positive aspect of virtue ethics. Virtue ethics also recognizes the communal and contextual nature of ethics, namely that we always come from somewhere and are inextricably embedded within living and extended communities. There is no ethical view from nowhere, even within Christian ethics, for even the scriptures are contextual and historical in nature. However, as will be noted below, this does not mean that there is no transcendent reference point. So those are some positive aspects of virtue ethics. Now let's look, examine some negative aspects of virtue ethics. The first problem with net virtue ethics is the tendency to overemphasize character and de-emphasize actions. So there is an unfortunate tendency in virtue ethics to almost ignore doing, that is the deontological aspect of ethics, in order to focus on the being or the ontological character aspect of ethics. Now, it is still quite possible for a person of excellent overall character, perhaps only occasionally, to do what is morally wrong. Free will means that more good moral character does not automatically eliminate the possibility or even high probability of doing something morally evil from time to time. If so, the action is still wrong, even if the overall character of the person is good, well-formed, and generally consistent. So the example I would give here is the example that we see in the at the beginning of the chapter on virtue ethics in our textbook, where it, it describes a person, a man who has been married and has been very faithful to his wife for many, many years. This is a man who has who had who is very um, has a long record of of being very virtuous, of having very virtuous behavior. But then while he is on a business trip, he has one weak moment when he commits infidelity, when he commits adultery with another woman at his hotel. And so the question then becomes, does this moment of infidelity negate all these years of virtuous living. And so this is the problem with virtue ethics because it does have a tendency to overemphasize character and de-emphasize action. Because yes, this man has a long history of being virtuous, but that does not mean that we should overlook this one night of infidelity 
because that is that action is a grave error, a grave uh, mistake, and it is morally wrong. So while there is no need to place to place the assessment of individual acts against the question of a person's character, because they may be complementary, this is all too often what virtue ethicists tend to do. Principles and virtues can, after all, be complementary, even necessarily so, rather than set in opposition to one another. Okay, so this is the first problem with virtue ethics. A second problem with virtue ethics is the tendency to overemphasize ethical narratives and de-emphasize ethical propositions and principles. Okay, so here again, there is an unfortunate tendency to set narrative against propositions and principles. In other words, um, virtue ethicists would emphasize the ethical narratives in the Bible um, over and above the um, and de-emphasize the propositional passages in the Bible. Propositional passages such as, say, the Ten Commandments or even the Sermon on the Mount. As we will see more clearly from future sessions, our worldviews and understandings are much more and much broader than simply the stories of which we are a part. As Dennis Hollinger rightly points out, the Bible contains multiple forms of ethical resources ranging from narrative to proverb to command. The nurturing of virtue by means of story in the context of community, the church, is an indispensable part of ethics, but the community also nurtures the moral life through command, principles, and theological paradigms. In other words, it is true that ethical narratives are important for us, but that is not the only ethical resource we have. We do need commands also. And some of these, as well as some of these other ethical resources that Dennis Ollinger mentions here. Another problem with ethical, uh, with virtue ethics is the tendency to overemphasize community and de-emphasize transcendence in ethics. In this situation, the content of the virtuous life, if it can only be applied by the eminent community, is no longer subject to or able to access any sort of transcendent evaluative standard. It would seem that we would be pushed toward communally based, that is, cultural ethical relativism rather versus just an individualistic relativism. So I think many of us would agree that individualistic relativism is problematic. Well, so is cultural ethical relativism. To assess and determine virtue requires some sort of evaluative standard of what constitutes a good motive and attitude coupled with a good action. Why should one so-called virtue, hospitality towards nature, strangers, for example, and not some other so-called virtue, treachery towards strangers, for example, be embraced by the community and or the individual? And the example I have here is of Don Richardson, who was a missionary um, to the Sawi in Irian Jaya. And um, in his book, 
the peace child, he tells um, the story of his experience there. And at one point, he was um, telling the story of the gospel to the Sawis. And so he was telling the story of Jesus's life to them. And when Don Richardson came to the park about Judas's betrayal of Jesus, he encountered a very unusual response because when the Sawi heard about Judas's betrayal, they began laughing. And the reason why they laughed was because in their culture, betrayal was considered a highly valued virtue. So this illustrates the point I'm trying to make here, which is that cultural ethical relativism is not always a good approach towards eth to take in virtue ethics because we know from the biblical account that Judas's betrayal of Jesus was not a good thing. It was a horrible thing. Thus, we need to know what the content of character should be. Should we be gentle, ruthless, proud, etc.? And if so, when should we, we be like each of these and to what degree? Without a transcendent reference point, we are relegated to the serious ethical problems of moral relativism in its various forms. Again, to quote Hollinger, he wrote, as Christians, we must assert that there is transcendent reality beyond the community's self-understanding, and that reality can be known and experienced through God's self-disclosure in the written and incarnate word. That divine revelation is itself a reflection of the ultimate foundation for ethics, the triune God. So, I want to give you a few final words. An action is morally good when it is performed by the right kind of person for the right reasons at the right time in the right place in the right way to the right degree or extent to try and bring out the right result. I should add, however, that while the result or outcome matters and should be taken into account, it ultimately does not determine the morality of the decision since it cannot be controlled by the moral actor or agent. Christians recognize all forms of ethical decision-making to greater and lesser degrees with the possible ex exception of strict relativism. Of course, by its nature, Christianity does tend to be more oriented toward virtue and deontological or principle ethics. So, in these two um, video lectures, we've looked at consequentialist ethics, we've looked at principle ethics, and we've looked at virtue ethics. We've seen what kind of ethics um, is proposed by each system, and we can, we've also evaluated each of these ethical systems. We've evaluated their, we've looked at their positive aspects, and we've looked at their negative aspects. And so we will continue our discussion about consequentialist ethics, principle ethics, and virtue ethics in our class session. So please come to class ready to talk about these three systems of ethics. And if you have any questions, you might want to write them before class so that you can remember what questions you have
and I look forward to seeing you in class. Goodbye.